Hello again, everyone. Greetings from Basildon. Now, if you don't know where Basildon is, it's in Essex. And Essex is that bit of England immediately east of London. Isn't it strange that I can sit here in Basildon and send a message to you in Kent? Now, this month's video is called Pentecost, What Happened Next? And in a way, that's just what happened next. The gospel message began to ripple out from Jerusalem and that process hasn't ended yet and it can't end until the end when Jesus returns and we won't need to tell people all about him at all because every eye will see him. And it all started in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Uh, you can read about it in Acts chapter 2. After the Spirit came like a wind and fell like a fire on each of the believers that day, they began to praise God in a variety of languages. Now remember, these were mainly Galilean fishermen and peasants. They would have spoken Aramaic as their mother tongue. The men would perhaps have understood some Hebrew from worship in the synagogue, and businessmen like James and John would have known some Greek, the language of commerce, while Matthew, as a tax collector working for the authorities, would have known some Latin. But in verses 9 to 11, Luke lists 15 different nationalities who could understand the disciples' words of praise, and they express their amazement. Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans, they asked. In other words, how did these ignorant yokels learn my language? Now, Luke says there were, and I'll need a deep breath for this, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judeans, Cappadocians, Pontians, Asians, Phrygians, Pamphylians, Egyptians, Cyrenians, Romans both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs present. Whew. But that's just a representative list, because earlier he had said that there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, meaning every nation with a Jewish population at that time. And they all understood what the disciples were saying although some deliberately misunderstood them. Some made fun, we read. Some made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Peter, in his sermon that followed, pointed out that this was unlikely. It's only nine in the morning, he said. As the late great Roy Castle paraphrased it, it's only nine o'clock and the pubs aren't open yet. Do you recognise the pattern being set? The first thing the Holy Spirit did was to enable the believers to communicate clearly the truth about God. And the first thing that some of the hearers did was to deliberately misconstrue that truth and mock the one speaking it. So, twas ever thus and twill ever be until the clouds part and the truth himself, Jesus, descends, and the mockers' mouths will be stopped. And I say that with sorrow and humility, because I too was once a mocker upon whom God took pity. So, with the Spirit's help, speak the truth clearly but don't expect everyone to like it. So, we are told that at that point, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. But we're not told what language he used. Remember, despite the miracle of the tongues, he could only speak one language at a time. So it had to be one widely understood. Luke wrote his account of the episode in Greek. But was he translating? Greek was the universal language of the Roman world at the time, and of course Peter wrote his epistles in Greek. 
But then again, did Peter use his own language, Aramaic? Now remember, he had a very thick accent. The girl in the high priest's courtyard had been able to identify him by it. So even some of the Aramaic speakers may have struggled to understand him, uh, just like we Cockneys can struggle with Geordies or Glaswegians. Or could he have used Hebrew, the language of the Jewish religion? Everyone who came to Jerusalem for Pentecost was, by definition, religious. Look, in the end, we don't know, and it doesn't matter. He spoke, and they understood. Use whatever language skills you've got to get the message across, and ask the Holy Spirit to make it plain. Remember, even if you are a great orator, you can only put words in people's ears. The Spirit is the one who takes the message into the mind and the heart. So first of all, it was remarkable that the Galilean fisherman preached the first Christian sermon. Although, come to think of it, that was actually second of all. First of all, it was remarkable that Peter stood up with the eleven in the first place. What did we read about them in the early hours of Good Friday? As Judas and his new friends seized Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, we're told that all his disciples deserted him and fled. And on Easter Sunday, on the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Do you see what the Holy Spirit had done? He had transformed that terrified bunch so comprehensively that they were able to stand up in the face of that international crowd on Pentecost, some of whom were already hostile, and speak. I used to think it was unfair in Revelation 21.8 where Jesus gives a list of those who stand condemned. I wasn't too surprised when he mentions the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts and the idolaters. But then he also said the cowardly too. Actually they're first on the list. That seems so unfair because we can't all be brave, can we? But then I remembered the Holy Spirit. Bravery isn't the absence of fear, it's the overcoming of fear. And as those cowardly apostles showed, the Holy Spirit can always make us brave enough when it counts. So what did Peter say when he raised his voice and addressed the crowd? Well, he preached a sermon. And as the Spirit had only just arrived, as I said, this must have been the first Christian sermon ever preached. I wonder how many sermons you've heard. I wonder how many I've heard or spoken. Yes, but how many can you remember? Not many, I suspect. But don't worry about that. You don't remember every meal you've ever eaten either, do you? And yet you are made up of all those meals. You don't need to remember every sermon because each one has had its effect and still lives in you in some way. But Peter's is the prototype Christian sermon. Jesus' sermons had been Jewish sermons. But now, as Peter talked about Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension, even though he quoted liberally from the Jewish scriptures, this was a Christian sermon, through and through. But it wasn't Peter's bright idea. He stressed that this was all the work of God through his Holy Spirit. He poured out this which you now see and hear, he said. Sometimes preachers express their own opinions, as is their right. You can take them or leave them, as is your right. But if God chooses to speak through a sermon by his Holy Spirit, well, 
you'll know, and we'd all better listen, hadn't we? Uh, have a read of Peter's sermon. It's Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 36. And you'll notice how short it is. It only takes about three minutes to read it. <laughs> That's not long, is it? Much shorter than this address. But actually, Peter's sermon was longer than that. Luke has given us the edited highlights. He says that Peter spoke to them with many other words. But even so, the power of the Holy Spirit means that those many other words wouldn't have been too many. However long it lasted, no one got bored. An hour from a spirit-filled preacher can seem quicker than 20 minutes from certain other preachers. He raised his voice, we're told. Well, that seems fundamental. A preacher's first duty is to be heard. But I'm shocked and saddened that often after a service, someone will say to me, I heard every word, suggesting that some preachers can't be heard. Look, if you can't project your voice, please don't preach. Write a book instead or, or record your sermons like this. He started with the joke about no one being drunk because it was only nine in the morning. Mm, I guess you had to be there. Jokes don't travel well, neither do they translate well. But the point is, he grabbed their attention. The most important part of any sermon is the beginning. The preacher has got to be saying, this is worth listening to. Well, why should anyone listen? But then, of course, you've got to provide something worth listening to. And Peter most certainly did. He talked about Jesus. Now, people are always interested in other people, especially famous people. And Peter explained just how famous Jesus was. As you yourselves know, he said. He talked about the origin of Jesus' celebrity, how he was accredited by God. And Peter told Jesus' story. And people always love stories. He said where he came from, Nazareth. What he did, miracles, wonders and signs. What happened to him? He was put to death by being nailed to the cross. Then how God had raised him from the dead and exalted him to his right hand. Now another thing that saddens me is when people say to me that not only did they hear every word, but that they understood every word. The implication being that some preachers are incomprehensible. One lady told me sadly that at her church they had deep teaching. So deep it seems that people were drowning in it. Peter made sure that everyone could understand his sermon by using language the audience was familiar with. They were religious Jews, so he peppered his talk with quotations from the Old Testament. In fact, he proved that Jesus is the Messiah by referring them back to what they already knew from their own scriptures. Our preachers should use the New Testament, as well as the Old Testament, of course as well as other sources, if it will help. Paul quoted from the Greek philosophers, even though they were pagans. Deep teaching, that's too deep. Well, it's no teaching at all, is it? Peter had had no formal training, and as far as we know, he'd never preached a sermon before. But he had served a three-year apprenticeship with the master himself, and so he spoke powerfully. He finished his sermons with the words, Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Wow! He called them all 
murderers. Pete, that's no way to make friends and influence people. No. But while a preacher's job is definitely to influence people, the aim is not necessarily to make friends, at least not at first. We must tell the truth. Someone once asked me to stop preaching about sin because it upsets people, she said. I couldn't comply. What was Peter meant to say? You crucified Jesus. Oh, but it doesn't matter. Our sin did crucify Jesus. So it definitely does matter. You can't preach the good news without preaching the bad news first. But, as Paul said, we preach the truth in love. We don't talk about sin just to make people feel guilty, but in order to... Well, what happened next? When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? In Isaiah 55, 11, God says, My word will not return to me empty, but will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. If I didn't believe that, I would never preach again, because often the congregation leaves with not much more than a murmured, Thank you. I have to believe that the Spirit is doing his silent work in their hearts out of sight. But sometimes, as on the day of Pentecost, someone responds openly and asks what they should do as a consequence of the sermon they've just heard. We call it being convicted. So what did Peter say? Oh, try to be much nicer in the future. No. Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All we can do is tell the truth as we understand it, using all the gifts that God has given us, then we have to stand back and leave the results to him. Those who accepted his message were baptised, we read. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And to prove that this was a genuine work of the Holy Spirit and not just some appeal to emotion, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And other people noticed. Everyone was filled with awe, we read. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When God starts something, it's like a stone cast into a pond and the effects ripple out until, well, the day of Pentecost is still rippling, it seems to me. Now, I have seen many people converted in my 37 years as a Christian. And many baptised. I've baptised several myself, including someone just last month, and another baptism is being planned for the summer. But I don't suppose I've seen 3,000 people converted. So, have the Pentecost ripples reached the shore then? Is the spirit growing tired? <laughs> of course not. Then, all Christian activity was concentrated in just one place. Now, after 2,000 years of evangelism, God's people are busy everywhere. Every day is a Pentecost now. Right now, spirit-filled preachers are preaching spirit-filled sermons. Right now, people are crying out in response, What shall we do? And right now, people are being baptised all over the world. It's estimated that 2.7 million people become Christians every year. That's over 7,000 people a day, every day. 
But back to Peter's sermon. Now a sermon may be brief or long. It may have cracking jokes. It may have erudite and appropriate quotations. It may even be all about Jesus. But unless it reaches hearts, it is just hot breath. It's said that Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was a nominal Christian at the time, was driven into a Methodist church in Colchester in 1850 by a blizzard. There, a substitute preacher was struggling through a sermon. But the Holy Spirit was in the sermon, and Spurgeon was cut to the heart by Isaiah 45.22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. He responded by faith, and became known himself as the Prince of Preachers. I've preached thousands of sermons, including several dozen, to you, but I'd never spoken in public until I was 27. If you'd asked me to before then, I would have shriveled up in fear. Plus, I wouldn't have known what to talk about anyway. But then Jesus rose by faith in my heart, and he gave me his Holy Spirit. And I haven't shut up since. You ask my wife. But none of us, not all of us, are preachers or can be preachers. Imagine the noise if we were. But every preacher needs others to invite the people to hear him or her in the first place, and then to help the new converts to grow. The preacher is just the one at the front. Think of how many people were needed to baptise all those converts that day in Jerusalem. Peter could only have baptised a few himself, if he baptised any at all. So what's your role? Please don't say nothing that's an insult to the Holy Spirit, almost a blasphemy. Remember what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12 about some being apostles and some being prophets and some teachers and some miracle workers and some helpers. What? Helpers? Yes. We can't all be apostles or even teachers, but we can all help. And as I've already said, even the apostles needed help. So, bye for now. Ask, what can I do to help? And don't you dare let that Holy Spirit fire go out. <laughs>